Hello, stalwart comrades, and welcome to episode two of unit two, early Roman mythology. So we've talked about early Roman religion. We've talked a little bit about the god end of mythology, and we've touched slightly on hero and ancestor worship, another component of Roman religion. But who are these ancestors and what stories about them were so important to Rome's self-identity? That's what we're doing now. So without any further ado, let me stare into this light bulb and tell you about the early mythology of ancient Rome. Now we're returning to a map we visited before, looking at all of the local city-states in the area of Rome color-coded by uh, linguistic and ethnic groups. But this isn't the only thing in the mix in early Rome, at least from a mythological standpoint. One of the unusual but not unique elements of Rome's self-fashioning and early mythology is that they don't see themselves as being intrinsically local to Rome. That is, other city-states leaned into an idea called autochthony. I'm not going to ask you to remember that word, but it basically means that the people who live on the ground were born from the earth itself and are therefore true natives and therefore have a right to greater access to political power, to community respect, to human rights, and so on and so forth. Rome was not one of those city-states. While Rome did believe that local Italians from all different tribes converged in the city of Rome, their immigration origin myth is a lot bigger than that. And it's embodied in their primordial hero sort of founder, Aeneas. So let's talk about this cat because he's the central figure of your reading from Livy. Um, that's right, this is a good time to tell you a little bit about Livy. Livy is an author of the first century BCE, more, more or less. He's about the turn of BC and CE, so that's why I'm being a little cagey about it. He's a contemporary with the first emperor Augustus. For those of you following along, that's very far in the future of where we are now in the history of Rome. So why aren't we reading a document with early Roman history from 753? Uh, well, at one point, Rome's archives burned down. More about that later. And then subsequent historians didn't really write down one central version of the story because it was so part of the culture. This is the kind of story that you tell to your little Roman kids when uh, they're growing up and they haven't learned to read yet. You don't necessarily write it down in a storybook partly because storybooks kind of aren't a thing for Roman kids, precisely, although that's going to be invented in the Augustan period a bit. So these were stories that everybody knew, but I want to give you a Roman voice telling you these stories, and that's what Livy is. However, he's just one Roman voice. The details change depending on which Roman is telling these stories and to what audience and for what purpose. But the basics that I'm going to lean into here today don't change that much. Now, a few things you need to know about Livy to figure out why he's so caught up on the things he's caught up. He's writing at the end of the first century BCE, which is the period also known as the Crisis of the Late Republic. Astute observers will have noticed I mentioned he's working for the first emperor Augustus. The reason there's a first emperor in a republic that swore never to have kings again is because of the crisis of the first century. Rome was locked in near continuous civil war for a century, plus a series of foreign wars, plus internal revolts as enslaved people got sick of being enslaved, for gosh sakes you get the picture. Meanwhile, economic upheaval is rampant and there are huge population and demographic shifts within the elites of central Rome. 
as people are killed off in civil wars and political purges, and as new families step into those vacant places under new political patronage. This eventually leads to the enfranchisement of people from outside of the Italian peninsula being in the Senate. Uh, Julius Caesar starts this off with Cisalpine Gauls, which is irony if I ever heard it. But nonetheless, I will give Caesar that. He did enfranchise the Gauls. He didn't genocide. You'll notice I'm not giving him much credit for that, but, but it is an important point that's super duper relevant here, because part of why that could happen and part of why Rome continues to exist as an entity after what's essentially like a century worth of 2020 is that Rome had within it this um, renewability of its human resources, which is a super messed up way to phrase this. I'm not saying it's a good renewability because it relies on enslavement cycles and knuckle. But Rome did allow for people to become enfranchised and included within the Roman umbrella. They didn't have the kinds of um, ancestral citizenship tests that we see in places like Athens. And this, along with a, a good deal of just dumb luck on the part of Rome and stupid political decisions by the, t well, no, I don't want to get on the Ptolemy's case. They did okay. Um, the Adelids, though, they know what they did. Um, at any rate, the point to all of this is, Livy is trying to write an early history of Rome that's helping a generation, well, really three generations of Romans deal with why do we have civil wars? What is it about us Romans that makes us so prone to killing each other? Their early mythology helps them think through that. Another question they're asking is, what does it mean to be a Roman? Who counts as Roman? Who doesn't count as Roman? What does Roman even mean? Like, what do we look for when we identify somebody as in us? And what do we look for in a them? And then finally, what are things that Romans can rally behind and reunite underneath? And that I think is the most important thing Libby's thinking about is how do we not kill each other? How do we come together? How do we embrace a future that doesn't look a lot like our past? And how do we make sense of a political reality that is really changed from the political reality we grew up in. So these are the things that tell you why Livy's saying what he's saying, and these are the things I'm going to lean into as I take you through the characters in these stories. I am not, however, going to tell you the whole stories. That's in your reading. I'm just going to give you a sense of which names are important, some stuff you need to know about these folks to kind of get what's going on in the story. There are a lot of names I'm not going to ask you about, so don't panic when you see all of the names. If the name's on the slide, I'm going to ask you about it. If it's on the study guide, it's important. If it's not, you can kind of let it slide. Just kind of remember what happens and who these main characters are. Okay, without any further ado, so let's talk about this mixed Roman heritage. This ancestral hero deity I was talking about is Aeneas. So by some, not all Roman traditions, but many, Aeneas was this escapee from the Trojan War. For those of you not familiar, this is a mytho quasi-mythological war. For our purposes, it's a mythological war. Uh, we think it's related to memories of the Bronze Age, but it highly fictionalized, like literal gods show up on the battlefield. So a little fictionalization. And ancient people knew that. They realized that gods don't literally show up most of the time. So Aeneas is not a Greek, but a Trojan. And that's an interesting uh, feature of this story from the outset, because those of you who are familiar with the Trojan War will remember that the Greeks win, the Trojans lose, their city is burned to the ground, sacked, the people liquidated and either enslaved or murdered, and then exported to be um, 
exploited abroad until they died, especially the women, many of whom end up um, being forcibly impregnated by their enslavers. It's very bad. Uh, Aeneas is a special Trojan in that he has a mortal father. Anchises is the guy's name. You don't need to remember that exactly. But his mother is the goddess Venus, um, Greek Aphrodite. This is part of the myth as early as Homer. So this is in Homer. He's a named character. At one point, he gets into a fight with somebody in the Iliad, and then his mom shows up and, like, plucks him off the battlefield. And he's like, Mom! And she's like, look, you're going to thank me for this someday. He doesn't. Um, the story doesn't have a really happy ending for poor Aeneas. So Aeneas is now a refugee from the losing side of a war who has narrowly escaped being kidnapped, killed, or trafficked. And not just him, but his father and his son. He also had a wife. His wife was killed in the escape attempt from at, attempt. He did it. She did not, however. Um, they got separated and she was killed in the fighting. So his family is broken as a result of the Trojan War. And then he begins to wander the earth in search of a promise that the gods made to him that he would found a new city somewhere. And eventually the gods send him like follow up memos and he figures out where he's going and yay. So a couple important things to notice about this myth. There are three things that Aeneas takes with him when he leaves the city of Troy. And the first you can see here in this illustration, this is from a Roman fresco, one of many. Romans loved having this on the wall. So here is Aeneas. He is the dude in the center. And then on his back is this um, surprisingly tiny little dude. That is his father, Anchises. You can tell it's his dad because he's got a beard. He's carrying Anchises because Anchises is disabled. He is unable to walk, and therefore his son has to carry him. In his other hand, you can see he's holding his little kid's hand. That's Ascanius. His other name is Eulus. Like many people in myth, he has two names. Just go with it. So Ascanius slash Eulus is the ancestor of one of the founding families of Rome, the family Iulia, as in like Julius Caesar and also Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus Augustus, the first emperor of Rome, which is why this is so relevant. So this is not just the ancestor of the Roman people, but also the ancestor of Livy's boss. Now, this story was in place well before Julius Caesar and his family took over the Roman state. This was a family legend from as far back as we can trace it, so this kind of comes baked in. Every family has a legend. Not every family can parlay that legend into an excuse to be deified, which is what ends up happening with Julius Caesar and company. Bit of an awkward deity though. Uh, Venus, as I mentioned before, may not be your first choice if you were picking gods out of a hat, but the Caesars had to do what they had to do with what they had. Uh, so the other bit, so his dad, his son, and then here his father, sometimes you'll see it also in Aeneas's hand. There's the kind of box shape, sometimes it'll be a little statue. These are the lares and penates that Aeneas takes from his household to Rome. So I mentioned you can sometimes transplant a lar from one bit of ground to another, and that's what Aeneas does. So he takes the household gods of Troy, brings them into Italy, and uses those as the foundations of the Roman state and his own household. This is something that's also really important when we're thinking about Romans. The family is the basic unit of the state. Other Mediterranean states build a wall between your family and the state. These are two different spheres. The family is the abode of women. The state is the abode of men, broadly speaking, like vast generalizations here. 
Rome, not so much. They viewed the household as the smallest unit of the state, and they expected that the household would be harnessed in service to the state, and that the state in turn was a collection of Roman citizen households coming together in the shared project of government. These are vast generalizations, but I think this gives you the essential um, flavor of what's baked into Rome and why they're going to make some of the decisions they make here. So when Aeneas chooses what to take with him from his home city, the fact that he takes his father, his elders, his son, his future, and his household gods, which are both his household, but for Romans also part of the state, the smallest unit of statehood, he's following a Roman version called pietas. And I'll have that on another slide, but that's a term I'm going to ask you to think about when you look at Livy. Pietas is related to the English word piety, but it doesn't mean piety. It means what, obeying one's duty to the gods, the state, and the family. Not necessarily in that order, like all at the same time. They're all equally important and you have to obey them all at once. And if you think that might conflict sometimes, you are not wrong. This is one of the things Aeneas has to deal with, is that he's so caught between respecting his father, but also respecting his homeland that he just abandoned, but he's got to found a new homeland, and he's got his gods, but the gods are giving him bad information, and sometimes he has to make choices that aren't great for his family. All of this creates in Aeneas a building tension that we'll see when we read our other Aeneas reading. That's going to be Virgil's Aeneid, but we're not going to get to that till we get to the age of Augustus, so stay tuned. Now, Aeneas doesn't really get all that near Rome. Uh, in the Aeneid, like, he visits it once, but he does not found Rome. He doesn't even found a city. What he does do is marry a local Italian and then die shortly afterwards. It's his son, his future, um, Ascanius, or Iulus, who founds, uh, not Rome, another city, Alba Longa. You may have noticed it as one of the little dots near Rome. So this is the first step in founding Rome, but it's not happening in Rome. For that, we need another few generations of mythological pre-Romans. Here are a couple other statues of Aeneas fleeing his home city to give you an idea of what this looked like in other artistic representations. These are important to be able to pick out because this is for Romans an image that's important and foundational as perhaps uh, the Lincoln Memorial and Lincoln statue might be to people who grow up in America. This is one of these images that when we think patriotic thoughts and we think about what the ideal Roman is, we think about Aeneas carrying his dad, taking care of his kid, also holding his household gods and getting them the heck out of a burning dodge. However, in this story, there's a contradiction. Aeneas is abandoning his homeland. And as I just said, Pietas, one of the big three, is your duty to the state. How can we say that Aeneas exemplifies Pietas when he's abandoning his hometown? Well, versions of the myth usually have the gods showing up and saying, hey, Aeneas, Troy is doomed. The gods have decided Troy is no more. You're going to found new Troy. So in that version, yeah, it's not Troy, but it's new Troy. It, it's it, in an extreme situation. It can be patriotic to refound your city. So that's a thing. There are other versions that lean a little bit more heavily into this dark side, though, saying that, yeah, Aeneas does have kind of a funky track record. And that's something the ancient Romans kind of sat with. Both Aeneas is meant to be the emblem of perfect Romanhood, and yet 
there are some cracks in that Roman hood, and this is something Romans used to think through their own tension with patriotic expectations. So I find this a neat image when I look at it, because I see in it both Romans aspiring to be the best good people in their own terms that they could be, but also looking at an unattainable ideal. And I wonder sometimes if I were an ancient Roman looking at these statues, would I feel despair? Would I feel inadequacy? Would I feel inspiration? Would I feel hope? Would all of these things be there? That's the thing. Okay, so on to the descendants. We have this family tree. I'm not going to ask you to know everybody in here. The main bits where we're going to pick it up are with Numitor and Imulius. So these are brothers. Numitor is the older brother, so he's meant to be the heir to the throne of Alba Longa. We're not in Rome yet. However, his brother exiles him from the city, so Amulius kicks Numitor out. And Numitor's only child is a daughter named Rhea Silvia. Amulius forces her to become a Vestal Virgin in Alba Longa, and thus he keeps her from having any kids who would challenge Amulius's claim to the throne. Weirdly, he didn't kill his brother. His brother's just like hanging out on a farm somewhere in the countryside. So, Rhea Silvia, however, has the ill fortune to be raped by the god Mars. And this is considered rape by ancient Romans, too. This isn't just my modern eye saying no consent rape. Romans, too, thought yes rape. This is not a great situation. Consent is not involved. Not okay. Uh, although for Romans, they'd say that the problem is not that Rhea Silvia didn't consent, but Vesta didn't consent, and neither did Amulius. So, like, Romans aren't that woke. I'm so sorry. So, Rhea Silvia has twins, Romulus and Remus, but as you may recall from the overview of Vestal Virgins. If a Vestal Virgin has sex, she's considered to have broken her vows. The punishment is death, regardless of whether a god did it, whether you cooperated or not, or consent was involved, does not matter, because now the security of the state is at stake. So Rhea Silvia does not survive this myth she's buried alive and dies and it's freaking awful her kids amulius um still not being quite as bloody minded as he could be i guess although he just buried his niece alive so gosh he takes the twins puts them in a basket and then sends them down to the river to be drowned but the two guys sent to drown them the river's flooded, it's really swampy, it's not safe to wade into the water, so it's not that they don't want to kill babies, they just don't want to drown while they're killing babies. Gosh. So they put the basket into the water and it floats down the bank and fetches up on the river bank. And if that sounds like Moses to you, yes, it sounds like Moses to other people too, and we're not quite sure what to make of that. Uh, folklorists have spilled a lot of ink. If you're really super interested, a Google on JSTOR will get you some of those scholarly takes. But the point to this is that Romulus and Remus survive through the intervention of maybe. Oh gosh, sorry, there was a slide with still more art of this situation on it. So here is Rhea Silvia. There's Mars just hanging out, not helping with his two little babies hanging onto his legs here and here. Uh, here is Uncle Limulius in the process of dropping a stone. That's what he's holding here onto Rhea Silvia, thus burying her alive as you do. Uh, while all of the gods watch, it's just, ah. You will notice, however, our next dramatis personae, rather dramatis persona, because there's just one of her. This is a lupa, or a lady wolf, 
there was a wolf who had just had puppies who saw a basket full of little wee humans and she's like oh they look cute i'm going to nurse them too which brings us to one of the most common uh, tagging images that romans use when they want to show the world their romaniness uh, more about this particular wolf in a bit uh, i'll get to that here we have legit romulus and remus fan art from the actual ancient world you notice a lot of these are kind of sketchy looking that's because they're on coins they're very small some of these are from larger relief sculptures so this is really common this is about as common for romans as pictures of george washington are for americans and you've got these two little babies and they're nursing a wolf. Livy gives you an alternative explanation for lupa. I'll just point out that the word for prostitute in Latin is also lupa because they called them she wolves because they go out and they hunt for men. Okay, Romans. A note about this here wolf the one at the bottom in the bronze this is the one you've likely seen before it's really popular in set decoration especially if the roman senate's involved they just like slap this wolf up there there was a lot of debate about the wolf not the twins the twins we knew were added in the renaissance but the wolf we weren't sure if this was an ancient she wolf sculpture like maybe etruscan maybe even pre-roman or whether this was a medieval fan art version and we went back and forth and back and forth the latest word on this is that it was made in the 11th century ce so it is medieval she wolf fan art oh well but if there's ever a trivia night and you need to feel superior you can bring up that factoid that uh, no actually that's not really roman maybe you're less smug than I am. No judgment. So here are the twins, Romulus and Remus. Now, the name should sound familiar to you by now of Romulus, but you may wonder, well, why aren't we calling Rome Reem? Or why aren't we calling it Remurom or something? Well, because these twins didn't get along very well being the children of mars doesn't make you a particularly stable family and perhaps having both venus and mars's bloodline in the mix makes for some contradictory impulses where you hurt the ones you love which is what ends up happening here no spoiler but no, I, I will give you the spoiler romulus kills his brother remus over some nonsense remus apparently makes fun of romulus's walls because they're so short and then romulus is like screw you and then kills him and then's like i did it because he invaded my walls and the romans are like dude now let us revisit pietas for a minute you're not supposed to kill your brother that's not how we honor our family i mean it's not as bad as killing your father killing your father is much worse but killing your brother is bad yet killing your brother is something that romans have a tendency to do a lot also human beings but this is a persistent issue for romans so part of the subtext in the romulus myth is that the first roman romulus mr rome was a brother killer he was a founder he was a beginner but also from its inception rome is built on a brother's blood and that matters for romans that's a story that they sit with and point to as they process their mid-centuries of trauma and it's not the end of it either the crisis of the third century makes the first century look like a rehearsal so you know 2021 could be worse let's try not to raise that bar shall we 
Okay, so on to the next problem in early room, because we're not done with Mr. Rom Romulus yet. Because he needed people to live in his new city, and new cities have a bit of a problem in attracting new people, because most people already have a city, and people who don't already have a city usually don't have a city because something has gone horribly wrong for them. They have, at best, escaped enslavement, less good, they have been accused of crimes and kicked out of their hometowns, or they have left voluntarily, or they have fled the death penalty, or they just don't get along with people and want to hang out in the countryside mugging people for their stuff. Suffice to say that getting people willing to move into your new city-state is a little difficult. You Usually, if you were founding a new city-state, you'd be coming from a bigger city with surplus population. You band together to make a colonizing group and then go and then move in. Romulus wasn't like that. Aeneas and his Trojans had fully integrated into the Italians. They dropped the Trojan language. Like, they're not speaking Hittite. They're speaking Latin. They're using Latin names for all intents and purposes. They're Latins now with a little bit of Trojan ancestry. So Romulus can bring a few people from Alba Longa, but one of the things they do is they get their dad out of his exile on the farm. They kick out their uncle and they put their dad back on the throne. So Alba Longa is politically stable again. It's fine. Why would you leave Alba Longa to go move into a bunch of huts on the Palatine and the Capitoline? So Romulus decides to go to Plan B, wherein he pardons people to give them a second chance in Rome. He says, basically, we're not going to do background checks. If you move into Rome, we'll give you a clean slate and you can come be new Romans. But due to crime demographics and uh, gender norms in the period, these people were pretty much all men. And that is a problem if you're trying to reproduce. So Romulus needed some women so he could have more Romans that they made locally. So what he does is he starts sending out ambassadors to all of the established towns around Rome saying, hey, we're an up and coming new city state and we need your daughters to come make babies with us. We're not criminals anymore. I just killed my brother the one time. <laughs> so uh, let me ask you, assuming you had a daughter who had not been exiled for criminal activity, would you send her to go marry a Roman? I think not. Uh, most Italians agreed. I mean, maybe you're more forward thinking. Maybe the penal policy was unfair. I don't want to assume anything about these early Romans except ancient Romans thought this was super problematic. And what happens next is even the heck more problematic. Romulus decides if he can't beg or borrow women, he can steal some through tricking people at a sacred festival. Now, we've mentioned Pietas, yes, has three rails. So there's family. Romulus has already thrown that one out. Gods and country. I guess it's kind of okay on country. He doesn't really screw that one up. So let's see how he does with the gods. This, by the way, is a Jacques Louis David painting of a later incident in this current plot line. Uh, Romulus, this, this worked a lot better when I wasn't recording this, but I'll just tell the story now and then move on to the cherry races later. So, Romulus sets up a game in honor of the god Neptune. Neptune, you may know primarily as the god of the sea. He's also the god of earthquakes. In fact, he's the god of earthquakes first and the sea second, because if you have an earthquake and there's a sea, you get tsunamis. So they're connected, and ancient mythology acknowledges that. So Neptune is also the god of things that make the earth rumble other than earthquakes and ocean waves. One of those things is horses. So when you would put together a festival in honor of Neptune, you'd have 
force-based athletics as a way of simulating that earth-shaking feeling and honoring Neptune. They were the sacred animals of Neptune, also bulls, but rodeos. Eventually they kind of get into bull sports, but mostly Romans are chariot racing kind of people. Uh, a little bit more about NASCAR than they are about uh, rodeo clowns. So he invites the neighboring folks from the Sabine Hills to come to Rome for their brand new inaugural Neptune Festival and NASCAR races. Um, of course, there's no inter internal combustion engines. These are chariot NASCARs. So the out or the Sabines are like, oh, great. So why did the Sabines not suspect shenanigans? After all, they know the Romans are looking to have some women and they know that Romans are kind of shady dudes. Well, this is a sacred festival in honor of Neptune. And the rules of sacred festivals are, you don't spill blood at a sacred festival. You don't rape people at a festival. You don't steal people's daughters at festivals. And uh, you also don't give birth at festivals. That's not relevant here. I thought I'd just throw that out. Because it's sacred ground. There are sacrifices, there are prayers, and even the chariot racing is in honor of the godhood of Neptune. And whatever god is in charge of the festival is the god who's re responsible in part for punishing breaches. So the Sabines are thinking, oh no, Neptune is going to be there. Neptune's not going to let this turn into an attack because nobody wants to piss off Neptune, especially if you've just founded a new city because Neptune's the god of earthquakes. Your entire construction budget is going to be totally wiped if you mess with Neptune, except that's not how this works out, because, I don't know, Rome gets a pass somehow. So, at a given signal, while everybody's distracted watching the chariots, the Romans all pick a woman and grab her, and then cart her off back behind the city walls, which are now big enough to work as city walls, and the Sabines are left totally caught off guard. They didn't bring weapons because it's a festival. You're not supposed to bring weapons to a festival. So the Sabines are like, oh gosh, we've got to regroup. So they go home, they plot their revenge, they get together people from other city-states in order to bring together a posse to go get their women back from the Romans. And it takes them about a year, by which point the Romans have fathered children with the Sabine women who are in a a, a no-win cluster bomb of a situation at which point and this is a difficult part of the myth and not just difficult for me modern person who believes rape is wrong but also for ancient romans ancient romans found this super disturbing and i find that actually a bit comforting it, at least our common humanity goes that far. That's that's nice, I guess. This myth, however, is not. So the Sabines show up. They march on Rome. The Romans show up. They begin marching against the Sabines. And the Sabine women come down onto the battlefield with their babies in hand, and they stand between the two sides, which is what this painting is. This is uh, Jacques-Louis David loved doing Livy fan art in the context of the French Revolution is a really good time to think about civil war, isn't it? So here they are standing between the two parties and this shuts down the war. From their point of view, they're kind of stuck with their new husbands now. Ancient rape apologists were like, you know, they realized the Romans were good husbands, so they just got used to the idea. Ancient people who were not rape apologists were like, well, they're just stuck now because who's going to marry them? So they're making the best of a bad situation. I mean, it's bad either way. It's just flavors of how apologetic the bad gets. And at any rate, from their point of view, they now have a family that they've started over here with the Romans. They also don't want their fathers and brothers to die. So they make an executive decision to intervene and to impose peace between the two warring factions. And this works a little bit, kind of. This is what some Romans used to justify Romulus's actions. 
those who were Romulus uh, fans would say, oh, well, you know, it was the times, it was a rough and ready period, and Romulus asked first, and everybody said no, so they kind of forced him into it, like it, it gets to a very victim blamey place with some Romans here, and, you know, it was necessary for the future of Rome. Other Romans are like, uh-uh, like they violated the rights of the fathers to decide who their daughters marry. They violated a festival of Neptune. Romulus made a bad, desperate call here. He should have found another way. This was unnecessary. Like, where was his faith? You know, he's, he's a son of a god and a descendant of another god, for goodness sake. Surely he could have asked for a solution. Philosophical Romans would say, well, he is the descendant of Mars and Venus. What kind of behavior do you expect? He's confused. I am comforted by the fact that even the most, like, uh, trying to be okay with it Romans uh, still find this off-putting and problematic enough that they spend energy explaining it. And this is something that Romans really did wrestle with. Like, what does it mean that the first Romans were the product of violence? What does it mean that Roman women were drug into the state unwillingly without their family's backing? And that's part of the myth too, because there are downstream consequences of this. This story is not yet over at this point. The Sabines, don't forgive and forget. However, the Sabines plan another go at Rome because they've had their rights violated. Like, I do not blame them. So what they do at this next stage is under their king Titus Tatius, they plan an assault on the fortified center of Rome, the Capitolium. So this is the hill that eventually is going to have Jupiter Optimus Maximus and Juno Mineta on it. This is a hill that has an escarpment on one side, and that's what we're looking at here. So this is a, a cliff side that's had some buildings built up against it, but you can see how there's this steep drop off the side of this rocky outcroppy cliff here. This is Tarpeia's rock, sometimes also called the Tarpeian rock. And this is the place where traitors to the state of Rome were pushed off the ledge. Sometimes you'd like torture them, beat them up and push them off the ledge. Sometimes you'd kill them, then dump them off the ledge. If you were really angry, you'd put hooks in them, drag them down the Gamonian stairs and then maybe take them back up and throw them off. Romans can be quite extra when they're mad at you, is my point here. And this all goes back to the story of Tarpeia, which is also in this same era of Romulus mythology and Livy. This, too, is a really old myth that was in the Roman canon long before Livy shows up. And this is a coin showing the scene at which Tarpeia gives her name to this rock. So Tarpeia is a Roman woman. She's one of, um, no, she's older, she's teenage, so Gosh, I'm not sure how this timeline works. She might be like a grown-up product of one of these Sabine rapes, but I actually need to. I haven't thought about this. Oh, goodness. Well, Tarpeia is outside the city, and then she runs into some of the Sabine scouts, and then she sees an opportunity to make a deal. She looks on their arms, and they've got these nice bracelets, and she's like, hey, if you give me those bracelets then I'll show you how to get in behind the walls. The Sabines are like, wait, wait, what do you want? She's like, I, I want those things on your arms. And the Sabines are like, yeah, we'll give you the thing on our arms if you show us the way into the citadel. So she shows them the way into the citadel and then they drop the things that are on their arms on top of her. Now they had on bracelets, yes, but they were also wielding shields the other things on their arms are their shields. These are typical early Roman shields here, and they're dropping them on top of this female figure who's currently on her knees, sinking down, like begging for her life, because she's being crushed to death in a pile of shields. The Sabines at this point decide that if somebody will betray their own people, then they don't deserve to live, even if they're not on their side, so death to traitors, go die. 
and in Tarpeia's dishonor, Romans named their traitor's rock after her because she was Rome's first traitor. Lovely. At this point, let's pause for some more depressing ancient Roman news to talk about what else is at the bottom of the Capitoline Hill. So at the base of the Gamonian Stairs and the Tarpeian Rock is Rome's first prison. And this is a prison that was used as pretrial holding for very important political prisoners and prisoners of war. One of the things Romans would do as part of their victory ritual, I've mentioned the triumph, the leaders who were defeated and marched in the triumphal parade before the triumphing general went up the stairs to sacrifice to Jupiter, he would pause for a minute to stuff his enemies into this space here. So this basement, um, it's a church floor now for reasons I'll get into in a minute, was the pretrial holding cell. And then there's this little hole here into a sub basement that's connected to a well space uh, that that wells more of a drainage area because they would either starve you to death or murder you and then stuff you into this space or they'd stuff you into it alive and let you starve to death there it just depends on what the romans were feeling like this week and this is part of rome's ritual of uh terror that becomes a very real weapon in Rome's arsenal. So this is a very old structure. It's built into these early myths of Rome. It's tied up with the history of the Tarpeian Rock a little bit too. Uh, the Mamertines are a people of the Italian hillsides uh, inland in the Apennines from the Sabines. And when you decided to fight against the Romans, as a non-Roman Mediterranean people, part of what you'd have to sit with is that if the Romans win this war, and if they get their hands on you, they're not gonna kill you immediately. They're gonna put you in chains and they're gonna keep you until the triumph. Then they're gonna parade you through the streets and then you're, they're going to kill you in a ritual and horrible way in front of a cheering mob of Romans. It's going to humiliate you it's going to humiliate your people and it's going to be personally terrifying like i've i've visited this space before last time i was in italy and it's one of these places where i don't know if it's because i know who all died there and what it was used for or if it's just the feel of the place but it's a hard place for me to stand in because of the weight of death and despair that's in the history of the rocks. I feel the same way about the Colosseum. I find it actively upsetting to be there because I'm I'm sensitive and I'm okay with that. I think that's a good thing. At any rate, this meant that a lot of world leaders, when they got to a point where they were pretty sure Rome was going to win, they would take their lives or flee their country or a combination of the two rather than be captured by Rome. And this is where this becomes a weapon of terror. Because Rome makes it so humiliating and awful to lose to Rome, they create a situation in which their opponents are more willing to eliminate themselves for Rome. Now, Romans don't necessarily see this as a plus. Romans regularly get terribly horked off when world leaders do this to them. Um, one of my favorites is Cleopatra VII, who managed to do this to Aunt, um, Octavian, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Augustus, right? First emperor dude. Cleopatra made him look like a freaking idiot because she was brilliant and amazing and I love her. <clears throat> At any rate, this this is a, a fact that should never be far from your mind as we move into Rome's expansionistic phases, because it's never far from the minds of the people who are having to live in a world with Rome. And it's something that is always in the back of my mind when I'm dealing with Romans too, is that even the most woke ones of them 
are okay with murdering their opponents in basements. And what does that say about somebody? What does it say about a modern country that, you know, we do similar things to our enemies? I'm, yeah, I, I'm not sure how that sits with me precisely. And some Romans weren't sure how that sat with them either. We are not done with the depressing victory rituals, however. Allow me to introduce you to the triumphal arch. This was the last step of a triumphal parade, and it's not a parade, you'll notice, it's a building. So this is a kind of monument that was built over the top of a major roadway whenever a general had been awarded a triumph. Not necessarily in the city of Rome either, we find these in the provinces too. Sometimes the provinces are a better place to put them for reasons we'll get into in a minute. So these would have pictures of the triumphal procession. The pictures I showed you of the victory in Jerusalem come from this arch, the Arch of Titus. But why an arch? Well, this has to do with a battlefield ritual that was done as part of warfare in the Mediterranean. So this is not something Romans invent. Other nations do this too. Gauls do it, for instance, sometimes to Romans. You would take a yoke, which is something that you use to join two oxen together to pull a plow or a cart with. A yoke is shaped like this, so it's got two arches to it on a thick piece of wood, and then this wood is connected to the harness and the reins, and this creates a stable, sturdy platform that doesn't let your oxen get out of line with each other so they can pull in even straight rows. So really important for agricultural labor. And some triumphal arches will have two or three bumps in them, so they'll look sometimes more like a yoke. On battlefields then, once you had won, you would gather up all of the people who were still alive at the end of the battle, people who had surrendered as prisoners of war, their family members that you had kidnapped and were planning to traffic, uh, it, just a you know, whole big roundup, but mostly defeated soldiers. And defeated soldiers were, at least in Roman minds, and here I'm not signing off on this Roman logic, I'm just paraphrasing how Romans thought about this. You had a choice. You could either do this yoke ceremony, or you could take your own life. And it was felt that to take your own life was the honorable solution. Again, not condoning this, but this is what Romans were thinking. So if you make the decision to live, then you have chosen what to Romans was considered the coward's way out. And yes, this is victim blaming heavily so. And this meant, at least for a lot of Romans, that people who were enslaved as part of this process, and this was the main route into enslavement for people in the Mediterranean, so being captured in the context of warfare and living through that experience, you would then be sold off. The soldiers would split the proceeds, some of the proceeds would go to the state, so the trafficking of humans would be used to finance the expenses of that war and also to make a profit for the winning state. Then the labor of the people who had been trafficked would be used by their end consumers, which are more Romans, thus displacing freeborn labor, by the way, which is going to end up causing a, an economic and labor crisis later, so stay tuned for that. This is neither good for Rome, nor is it good for anybody in the Roman orbit, but it's a normalized part of life in the Mediterranean and one that a certain percentage of upper class Romans with money benefited immensely from. Keep this in mind, it's a plot point. And if you wonder if Romans had a problem with their one percenters getting the lion's share of profits from wars, Yes, yes they did. We we're going to look into a protest movement and how that worked out for first century Romans. At any rate, back to the yoke thing. So if you didn't have a literal yoke, you could also do this by holding up a couple of spears, sort of like the most depressing game of limbo ever. And then you would have the soldiers one by one walk underneath that yoke. 
bending forward, bowing, almost bent double to walk under the yoke. So think for a minute about what we're saying there. We're making human beings who were once free soldiers defending their homelands and their relatives bow, walk under a harness used to make animals do heavy agricultural labor, and then you are selling them. You are converting free human beings into property, into possessions, into things, into an economic product. And that is meant to be every bit as offensive and violent as it sounds. This is added humiliation. And it's also part of how the victors are justifying this. If you've ever wondered, like, how do people bring themselves to buy and sell and exploit and abuse other human beings? This is one of the ways that Romans justified this. They'd say they deserved it. They had a choice to surrender. They uh, they're the losers, they're not the winners, they fought against Rome, so they're our enemies anyway, so they're not fully people, and they'd also say, you know, maybe they'll be freed someday, and when you're freed, that's the path to Roman citizenship, and that's part of the carrot to this stick that would be dangled, is there's a, a tiny bit of hope of redemption for a very small subset of enslaved people. And eventually most Romans have enslavement somewhere back in their family tree. But this also becomes part of the justification, this kind of, it happened to us so we can do it to other people. Maybe it's not good, but it's the norm and we have to live in the world that we're given. And the reason why I'm going into this mindset is because this is a mindset that oh, maybe you're a better human than I am, but it's a mindset that I've had in other things. When I've thought about how okay am I with the labor that's making my clothes? Do I know that they're being exploited? Do I know if there's a sweatshop condition there? Do I know if enslaved labor was used to make my coffee or my sugar? How disconnected am I from that chain? what is my personal burden in this system? And the corollary to that, how can I avoid being part of it in a world where so much of our economic structure is built on prices that rest on labor markets that aren't always ethical? So I'm not drawing an equivalency here and I am absolutely not justifying, in fact, quite the opposite. I think we can too easily fall into a judgmental space that doesn't let us use this reality very well. And I'm not here for that. Like, why are we taking this class if it's not an opportunity to reflect and think and consider? Romans' blindness and complicity helps us sit with our own. And sometimes once we see the shape of justification in a Roman's words, we can take it back into our life and use it as a way of processing and doing better. So I'm not doing this to make anybody feel horrible about themselves. So please don't take it that way because this is not what I'm going for here. Um, but rather, this is one of the ways we dig ourselves out is good hard looks back and using our compassion and humanity to creatively imagine something else. All of which is to say, there's gonna be some dark stuff here. This is A, a history class, and B, about Romans. But this isn't necessarily a dark class. Romans themselves are gonna have some answers to these problems. And that's something we're gonna lean into and look at as we go ahead. Um, I find myself very much of the uh, Mr. Rogers look for the helpers school of coping. We're gonna be looking at some helpers this semester. All right, so a few more things and then I'm done, I swear. All right, let's talk about the chariot races. So. I mentioned chariot races, sacred to Neptune, don't kidnap people at them. 
chariot racing was a huge state-sponsored sport in the ancient world as part of its religion budget. So Neptune is part of the state religion. We worship him by having earth-shaking events, and chariot races are part of that. Gladiatorial games get folded into this too, so the same spaces used for chariot racing are also being used for gladiatorial competition. But Romans would have set aside chariot races as a separate event thing. And chariot races continue to be hugely popular all the way through the room. In fact, they're still popular because we still like watching fast things go in circles around a track while they run into each other and horrible accidents happen and things blow up and monster trucks run over things. You know. This is something that humanity still finds fascinating to watch. The safety protocols aren't as great for the ancient world, and whew, it's... Now I'll get to the safety protocols in a minute. So let's have a look at where we do this in ancient Rome. This brings us to another important landmark of downtown Rome, and this is another early one. As it survives today, the Circus Maximus is the, the fancier upgraded version built in much later years, but the space was already being used for chariot races in the very earliest stages of Rome. So as the Forum is developing on the other side of the Palatine Hill, so I'm gonna mark the Palatine Hill off in, is the blue showing up well? Let's try it in green. Oh, even worse, all right. All right, now it's in orange, and I'll just make it really super thick so you can see it. So there's the Palatine Hill, and I'm gonna put the Roman Forum in, in purple. So here's the Roman Forum. Capitoline Hill is to the northwest of that. And then in red, this long space is the Circus Maximus. Roman circuses are really easy to notice because they've got this very unique shape, this long stadium with a kind of flattened end and then a round end with a wall down the center. Smaller versions of this were used in foot races, but if it's big enough to put a bunch of chariots next to each other on, then you're looking at a circus. And we're finding more of them as we get better at looking at sketchy remains because often the stadium seating's removed and then it's kind of hard to tell you're looking at the footprint. But the Circus Maximus, we do know where it is and we've excavated it and you can go visit it today. It was made into a piazza, so it's got some Renaissance stuff cluttering it up. It used to have another triumphal arch integrated into it too. Another one to Titus, he got two, he's a double dipper for reasons we'll discuss later. So this is the place that was thought to be the location of the kidnap of the Sab kidnap, well, kidnap and subsequent raping of the Sabine women. And because of this, it, this was an ever present reminder for Romans that their, their first mothers were unwilling participants in the history of Rome. And this is something Romans had a bit of a hard time with. And it was an inescapable fact because there were several festivals held in this venue per year. And you couldn't be there without knowing about the Sabine women. Even if you didn't know, it would be brought up as part of the festivities, like the Vestal Virgins would come and watch too. So that's also part of the mix. And now this is already getting long, I won't pontificate about this too much more, just to say it, this is a myth that Romans feel icky about. And that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because the stories that you retell can go away, right? We lose legends and versions of legends all the time. But even though Romans found this a really distressing story of early Rome, they still keep it around. They still bring it up a lot. They still use it to think with. And I think embedded in that process is Romans thinking about their own problematic position as a state and the things that one must do to survive 
in this world where you're surrounded by better established places with more security over time with greater connections to the Mediterranean world with better natural resources to support them. Rome presents itself as an underdog here, and it's part of how it somewhat justifies the Sabine incident and the existence of Romulus, but it's also a place that Rome leans into when it's feeling uncomfortable about what it's done to get to where it is. This for Romans was the first, maybe not the first even, but one of the first moral compromises made in pursuit of survival as a state. And that makes it really important to Romans in general. And in that, I see a bit of an opportunity because every state has history and founders who have done stuff that is incredibly disturbing in order to bring us to the version of ourselves we have today. So how do we cope with a history that we benefit from that makes us sick to think about it? You know, the fact that UMBC sits on the land of indigenous people and we aren't giving it back. That is a reality we live with and are part of and benefit from uh, for reasons that our ancestors both chose and didn't choose. Like not all of us are here by choice and that is an important distinction too, right? Not everyone is in the United States because they had a choice. That's also another reality that we have to sit with as a nation and think about what do we do next? Do we justify this? Do, how do we undo it? Can we undo it? Um, what does that look like? What does healing look like? How do we not do that again? These are important questions and questions we'll see Romans asking themselves as they think about these stories. And that's the, the idea I'm gonna leave you on with uh, this other picture of a circus here with a chariot race in progress. So this is a fragmentary bit of art showing chariots in the process of colliding as they're going around the course. And we do this in red. So here they are at the edge running into each other as they try to go around the curve and their chariots are popping wheelies. People are watching from the stands, looking on, being entertained by the violence and people are winning here, so they're happy, these guys are losing. It, in this violent, entertaining, fascinating kind of navel gaze of art and history, we have an opportunity to reflect in a place that's just similar enough to be useful, but just alien enough to have some distance. And that's my final thought to leave you with. I know that this is a heavy week's worth of um, mythological history. And this is a lot of difficulty to process, but processing it at the outset and keeping it in our mind as we begin to answer the question of who are Romans and what did they give us? This keeps the stakes clear because if we don't ask ourselves these questions, then we're going to repeat the patterns that we inherit. Not all patterns are bad parents, patterns to repeat, but which ones are good and which ones are bad, we need to sort out before we're asking the question in hindsight. And that's why Roman history makes me hopeful too. We already do better. Someday we will do better. And it's on that note that I leave you. Next week, we're going to talk about Romans trying to do better. They're going to say no to kings and say yes to a sort of representative democracy. So let's see how that works out for them and what events come to pass to make that the case. Uh, just a heads up before you do that reading, that history is also very difficult as it centers around um, a member of the king's household 
raping a noble woman. So there is more rape ahead. It's unavoidable here, but we'll get a break from it after this next week. So take care of yourself. Do what you need to do to take a moment. And I will see you in week three. Ciao.